Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Art of Space Engineering. I am your host, Sarah Rogers. So this episode is the second half of a roundtable discussion with my friends Craig Knobloch and Vivek Chaco on developing the flight software for the Phoenix CubeSat. In this discussion, we'll detail our experiences with systems level testing, recruitment, and team dynamics. And if you haven't listened to it already, part one includes a really great discussion on our system architecture and the lessons learned on software development. So go and check that out if you're interested in learning more about the flight software side of Phoenix. Because this is the second half of the discussion, I don't want to make this intro too long. So with that, let's jump back into the discussion and explore our adventures in systems level testing and what it was like handling this project as full-time students while our classes slowly killed us on the inside. All right, so we've we've talked a lot about like the the general um, kind of top level architecture, how how we were structured and how we went about um, developing things. But but now I, I do want to delve a little bit into the more specific um, development challenges that we had while we were working on Phoenix. Um, so, in kind of segueing off of off of the end of the, the last one. Um, Another one of the, the biggest challenges that really hit us with development was how do we actually make Phoenix a full cohesive system? How do we how do we get to that minimum functionality point? And for us, you know, since we had never done anything like this before, it was really important for us to not just go down the list of our requirements, but to actually just start with the small chunks and just really see everything start to come together and track progress towards our mission objectives based on that. So the way that we kind of got around actually making Phoenix Phoenix was when we set schedules, our milestones were defined as very specific demos. Um, and so we would work towards a demo to do to demonstrate some some large component of that functionality and then continue to build off of that. So for example, our very first demo was take a picture and downlink it. Full functionality includes other things like pointing, um, sending schedules, but just to start out, we said, okay, we just want to take a picture with the camera and then send it to the ground station. Um, now, that sounds very simple, but that incorporates a lot of things. Like you have to be able to turn on the camera, you have to be able to take a picture, get that picture off of the camera's memory, store it on the, the OBC's uh, RAM, so that way we can then downlink it. And then it incorporates the actual downlink process itself, which is one of the most critical parts, uh, as we've said before, of, of um, the spacecraft is having a very robust and reliable link. And there's a lot that goes into just getting a packet from point A to point B. You have to have, you have to follow a specific um, amateur radio protocol. We used AX25. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there's a lot that, that really goes into just making that thing work. So we started there and then worked on adding other components along the way. So the next thing was pointing and all of the commands that were associated with just getting our ADCS system to orient the CubeSat at a specific ground target. Um, and then after that, we added things like scheduling, uh, telemetry collection, uh, GPS, time updates. And so all of those became little demos along the way. And once you add all of those up, then you have this full working system. That's really what allowed us to kind of organize um, the actual development process and have a very like well-defined system and method and, and milestones to go through in order to actually complete um, complete all of the requirements and get Phoenix to where it needed to go. Right. So you mentioned something about, uh, you know, the, 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 the demos that we had, right? So uh, one of the demos that uh, you mentioned was the uh, taking a picture and downlinking that picture. And since I personally worked on the communications bit, uh, what we as a team needed to do was take the entire demo and break it up into smaller demos. Because like Sarah mentioned, uh, this 
taking a picture and downlinking does incorporate a lot of functionality and uh, to get everything right in one demo in one shot is just impractical right so uh, we broke it up into really small chunks we started off and we said okay what's the first thing that we need to do uh, to reach that point and the first thing that we needed was to get a single packet downlinked uh, and that was just a random packet that was generated by the OBC and we had the ground station set up and we were like, okay, if we can send that packet, we can receive that packet and we are able to read the contents, we can go from there. And the next, next challenge would be to take a packet from the ground station and then uplink that you know, and have the OBC basically just print that packet. So we, the idea was we broke it up into these smaller little segments and that sort of helped us go closer to uh, what the target was. But uh, coming back to the development of the protocol, it poses a really interesting challenge because the, the data transfer speed is very low. And uh, in order to downlink an image at, at the speed, it would take almost seven to eight minutes. And a typical overhead pass is about three, four minutes, sometimes more, sometimes less. And I'm talking about the part, the pass, which is actually usable because anything below 30 degrees is often not usable at all. So we're talking about a very limited time and we need to ensure that we are able to download the entire image. So uh, the question was, how do we go about that? Uh, so we did a lot of brainstorming in, in the team and we were like, how do we come up with a solution that, that, that specifically targets this issue? So, so whatever data we get, uh, is still usable. So what we did was eventually we had to like break up the entire image into tiny chunks and download all of that and keep a track of how many chunks are there in that image and, uh, you know, figure out, okay, so we got. 90 out of 100 chunks, we just need 10 more. So the next time the spacecraft comes, we just request those 10 chunks and download that off. So things like this, we did come up with solutions, but I think the whole approach where we had specific demos and we broke it up into smaller demos was pretty critical to uh, making progress as we go and not have uh, a goal that was a little too difficult to uh, achieve, uh, but rather have smaller goals that were easily to easy to implement, you know, show progress as we went along. All right. So on that demo, the, uh, you know, take a picture and down like a demo. I mean, like you guys are saying, there's a lot of pieces of that demo, right? And from Vivek's discussion, you know, we he focused a lot on the, uh, the communication side. Um, and uh, we're also, there's also the, the picture side. So um, I was the developer for the camera for, most of it, I know that uh, Cody took over um, quite a bit of the development. I think it was passed around a lot, but uh, I think I wrote a lot of the the core um, software. And I remember um, when uh, Danny, our mentor, right? Is that was his title? Okay. So Danny says, uh, you know, just just take a picture. So I remember listening to him to hear that. And by the way, he's talking about you know take a picture and download. And his time frame for that was a week. Um, and it was like a week. I'm like he's like, yeah, take a picture, done it in a week. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna do it. Um, I don't know why. I was like, okay, I'll do that. But for some reason, I just got in a mood, and I was like, I'm gonna do this. So, uh, I, oh, I think that was like a sixty or eighty hour effort through the course of that week, right? And I was a full time hey, student. You you like tallied it up and I, I think it was actually like 64 to 70 hours or something like that. It was nuts. Um, yeah, I was a, a full-time student, like, a, like going through Monday, you know, and Tuesday and, and all that stuff. It was like, eh, I'll just push that assignment off. Ah, I won't go to class, you know? Um, somehow my flex, my schedule was flexible enough where I could actually do that. And that was good. But like, um, you know, it was just insane the amount of work that I had just, just kind of shove off into the corner to, to get that thing done. Um, and, you know, that development process, you know, it, it sounds so easy, you know, just take a picture. What is that, like one command? But like Sarah was saying earlier, it's not just take a picture, right? It's, is the camera on? There's take the picture. There is... Um, identify where on the camera the picture is get the picture off the camera which 
that sounds really easy, but that was the most painfully difficult part because the um, the picture getting process wasn't like, oh, uh, like how you interact with your digital camera on your computer, you know, where like the, the folder opens up and you just get the pictures out. It was, there are a bunch of memory blocks that are accessible via memory addresses. And it's not like you access one memory block and then you get the whole picture out. No, it's you figure out how big the picture is from some other memory block and then you and then where the picture is on, on which memory block and you go to that memory block and then you, you call from that memory block plus every other memory block that has components related to that picture and then you piece it all together. So that was a pretty big effort. And then there was writing it to the RAM, you know, in a, in a cohesive file and deleting it from the camera. A word of warning to um, anybody who has to delete stuff on hardware, be very, very careful. Please learn from my mistakes and read the documentation very, very thoroughly. I thought I was reading the documentation thoroughly. I wasn't reading it thoroughly enough. So in this camera, you know, you were interacting with memory addresses directly. So to pull stuff off, you interact with memory addresses directly, and to delete it, you interact with, with memory addresses directly, except when you are pulling it off, um, you are going in blocks of, of bytes, right? So like if each memory address held four bytes of data, then you would go to memory address one, pull four bytes off, go to memory address five, pull four bytes off, etc. So it, the documentation referred to these components as blocks, but it also referred to, um, you know, I'm not remembering this inter terribly correctly, but like there was, there was just something that I didn't look at quite thoroughly enough to really understand what it was talking about. And I mixed up um, the terminology. So I read that to delete image zero, let's say, then you would go to its location and delete from there, right? But I read that as you give the delete command the image number, right? So you could get an image number from the camera and then you could feed the camera the delete command for a certain image number, but it wasn't the image number. It was a memory address number. So I told me thinking to tell the camera to delete snapshot zero I told the camera to delete memory address zero. And in devices that have their own firmware running on them, uh, it's not always set in stone where the firmware is going to be, but in the, in the camera's case, the firmware was at memory address zero. Well, memory address zero <laughs> through like 20 or something, but you know, you delete one piece of the firmware and the rest of it's not gonna work. So I had, gotten it was like oh man it was like 50 hours into this effort and i'd gotten the picture taking the downloading all that stuff was working swimmingly um and then i went to test out a delete thing and all of a sudden i can't talk to the camera anymore i, I don't know what's wrong like all my code has worked so far all my tests are working and they're just not working anymore <laughs> um and that was that was a good seven or eight hours trying to figure that one out and you know that goes into the night, me and Cody are trying to figure it out, and Sarah comes in the lab at seven in the morning. I'm like, Sarah, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, that was a that was a very painful learning experience, but um, it was at least a cheap learning experience, both in cost to get the thing repaired and time, because we had a um, we had a flight unit that we could use, right? So we used the flight unit until the engineering unit was repaired. Yeah, I do remember that. We uh, we sent the camera back to Fleur in a Pelican case with a get well card that we had. We had everyone on the team sign. Uh, that was that was pretty great. I remember um, being a student and like not having like my head wrapped around like the uh, what was expensive and what wasn't. So I was on I was on an email chain with uh, Fleur support. You know where I learned that okay, I deleted the firmware, <laughs> and I was like okay, how much is that going to cost to fix? Because, like, Sarah, how expensive was this camera? The camera was nine grand. Oh, okay. Well, right. the, the flight, okay, so the flight model was nine grand. The EM mm -hmm. was six grand because it was oh. used. 
oh, we got a discount. Yeah. Um, okay, so so I had broken this six thousand dollar piece of equipment, <laughs> and um, um, but you know, on these projects, six thousand dollars isn't actually all that much money. You know, it is to me, but it's not like a gargantuan amount of money. But the point is, is to fix it. You know, I was in the the email chain with Flare Support, and they were like, "Oh, it's, it'll be like you know, two hundred dollars." And uh, you know, in my student, you know, not a lot of money head. I'm like two hundred dollars. Um, and so Jed comes in, and he's like, "Hey, what's the word on the camera?" And I'm like, oh, "I mean, like, we can get it fixed, but like, it's gonna be expensive." And he's like, "Well, how expensive?" And I'm like, two hundred bucks." That's not expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or something like, oh, that's not that bad. Yeah. 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 So to, to kind of finish out the, you know, the demo number one of taking picture and downlinking it, one thing that we weren't immediately aware of, um, but is really important to, to consider when you're, you're working on stuff like this and you have to transfer data from one, from point A to point B is, really making sure like you understand how long is that process even supposed to take and is the method that you've taken is it efficient enough to allow it to get there in as fast of a time as it possibly can so you know going back to what Vivek was saying earlier you know we've only got like a four three to four minute pass where we can actually have reliable communications with the spacecraft and so when we first started transmitting packets like like Vivek was saying it took us seven minutes no, it took us longer than that. It took us like yeah. 15 minutes to downlink an in entire image. You know, then we actually calculated it. Okay, so this is our bod. This is the size of the image. How long is that actually supposed to take? And it was not supposed to be 15 minutes. And I think at the end, it came down, was it three minutes or five minutes that it took to actually transmit a full image right. back to the ground? But it was, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot less. Yeah, so so there were several different issues that we had to fix in order to optimize the entire uh, data flow. What we noticed, like initially when we started off, we just were like, okay, this is the packet. We just want to shoot it out and let the ground station do its thing. The issues were with how fast we were sending the packets down to the ground station. And one might think that the idea is to send it as fast as possible, uh, but then that comes with a downside because the ground station is able to process certain number of packets per second. And if you overshoot that, it basically puts that into the buffer and then eventually lose that, that, those packets. So in turn, what was happening is that we sent out way too many packets than the uh, ground station could handle. And then eventually had to re request those missing packets. So taking, it, was, it, it took longer than ex ex expected. So I think the entire idea was to, to get into these details and trying to experiment with uh, varying every single parameter. So we came up with graphs and charts that told us, okay, if we keep increasing this, uh, the time between packets, uh, then there's this, there's this one point where it gives us minimum duration for data transfer, and then it just shoots up from there. So trying to come up with that optimal uh, settings was very key. And I think the takeaway here should be that it, I think it comes back same to the fact that, you know, you need to test it enough to ensure that have you come to the most optimal solution. And uh, in order to work your way towards it, uh, you might need to tweak several different parameters because uh, it's not just the code that is in play, but also the fact that you have different hardware that are communicating with each other. So is everything working optimally or is there something that you could change in order to make sure that if all of them communicate with each other in the best part possible uh, way? Continuing on with testing, in addition to setting smaller milestones that are achievable in a shorter amount of time, it's also really important, and, and this motto you will hear all the time in the aerospace industry, it's really important to test as you fly. Test as, as close to your flight configuration as possible and as soon as possible. Um, even if you don't, you're not fully there immediately, get as close as you possibly can because you're going to Everything is an iterative process and you're going to find things along the way. We found a lot of things along the way as well as, as we tried to actually, you know, connect, uh, connect our components together um, with all of the flight interfaces and 
just operate Phoenix as if it were in space. And this is especially important when it comes to plugging things in together. Uh, so when you're developing your software, develop it on the hardware itself. Uh, get as close to having your OBC talking to all of your components as possible. Um, because that's your flight system. That's how you're going to find any idiosyncrasies that you have in your setup. Um, one particular example of this is was actually an electrical issue that we we found out in the process of working towards this first demo of take a picture and downlink it. So in the beginning, everyone was was developing and and you know to to work things in parallel because we only had one OBC to to really develop off of we everyone was working on components independently so um like craig was plugged into the FLIR camera over the usb port and was developing code for that um and we had this and for i2c devices we had this aardvark i2c adapter which would plug into the pc 104 header of of our components and then you would plug that the usb end of that into your computer and you could develop and test code and see if it worked and so we had this thing set up where for um, our EPS and ever, anything else we were working with on I2C, we could run our code and it would communicate just fine with the hardware. And so we thought that we understood the system, we had this working code, um, and we, we were doing it this way because we didn't, at the time, we didn't fully understand how to upload code to the OBC. And so we were working both of these things in parallel in order to just get as much progress done as possible. Um, but because we did it that way, um, we didn't realize an electrical issue that we had with our setup. So it, it turns out that our system didn't incorporate an I2C pull-up resistor anywhere. So this was even when all of the boards were plugged in uh, to our flat sat and all of the interfaces were connected. Um, it turns out that, so none of these boards had I2C pull-up resistors because like our, our EPS and our battery system were uh, developed by Clydespace. And our AX100 and our OBC were developed by Gonspace. So we were using different vendors for different components. And um, going back through and looking at the rest of their systems, Gomspace had incorporated pull-up resistors on their EPS, and mm. Clydespace had incorporated the, their pull-up resistors with their onboard computer. So in both cases, since you know you have to deal with compatibility issues between using different vendors, and this was was not something that occurred to us when we were originally bought hardware, or even when we first started working with it, um, and. The only reason we noticed this was because we had the artwork plugged in and everything worked fine. And then when we unplugged it, uh, it wasn't working fine. And mm -hmm. we realized that, you know, really the only thing that was different between those two setups was the fact that the artwork included pull up resistors in it and those resistors weren't in our, weren't anywhere in our system design. So, right. um, to get around that, luckily we had an interface board, which was used to kind of facilitate some hardware compatibility issues that we had in our system and also incorporate ways for cable routing, power routing, um, uh, access port features like our, our USB connection. So we could program, we could upload software and uh, you know look at the command line interface um, once Phoenix was fully assembled, um, RBF features, all that jazz. So we were able to incorporate them there and that solved the issue. Um, but that just kind of harkens back to why it's so important to just test like you fly. And if you're developing anything, just develop it directly on whatever it is you're working with. Um, continuing off of testing as you fly. So there's the hardware side of things. And then there's also the software side of things. And it's, important that while you're going through your your system level development and testing to always be thinking of how do i operate this from space if i can't you know because once it's in space like it's it's gone and you don't have this when you're testing in the lab you have this very convenient command line uh and you can look at messages going you know coming from the spacecraft and 
debug things that are happening. You see errors when they, when they occur and you know exactly where to go to fix something. When it's in space, you don't have any of that. You yeah. can't see what's going on. Um, and so if you are uplinking a schedule file or executing a command, how on earth do you even know that things are going right? And so it's, it's really important to consider that as you're going through your development process. So the, the other side of tests you fly is, is really more oriented towards operations and that, that has a very uh, important root in your software development process and, and what features you add to it. So in testing as we flew, um, we ended up incorporating a, a bunch of additional software level features and ground commands that made things a lot easier for us to work with Phoenix once it was in orbit and we couldn't touch it uh, at all. We reached a point where we were like, okay, we should be at a point where we don't look at the terminal at all and figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very interesting because that, that opened up a lot of things that we missed during development, important messages and important signals that uh, tells us about the state of the spacecraft. Like uh, we realized that we need more of more logs, you know, so we, we sort of expanded our status logging system. We increased the number of uh, messages the spacecraft sent out. And I think that's the key to starting to test as close to the way you fly is that you get an idea of what it would look like when it's out in space and what we would need uh, in order to debug any issues that might come across. And um, yeah, the other area it really helped was, was in maintenance. So mm -hmm. one of the things that, that we really worked on in testing as we f flew is trying to understand, okay, you know, so Phoenix is only overhead for this small four minute duration. And so if we see something going wrong or we need to request information, um, what kinds of features should we be implementing into the software to allow us to conduct routine maintenance and make sure the satellite is, is operating okay? So like these are things like you know, sending packets to reset the OBC so that way it, it starts back up if there's an issue or if the clock gets out of sync sending being able to set the time on the obc from the ground like that's that's so important for scheduling because all of our schedules were working based off of whatever the time on the obc was if our clock got off we may never take a picture of um, a particular city target um, even things like requesting files seeing what files were in there uh, in the first place right and being able to delete files from the ground if necessary. All of these things were uh, what we found we needed to incorporate once we actually started testing and um, trying to, to think about, okay, if we only have this limited amount of time, what can we possibly add that will make this easy for mission operations and allow us to keep Phoenix healthy? I think even like, I, I remember uh, when it came to the heartbeat, we had like one packet. Uh, worth of data that we uh, needed to get through the heartbeat. And I think we spent a lot of time trying to f nail down exactly what we need in that uh, 200 bytes or something of information that would be critical. I think we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, <clears throat> we need the battery temperature, the battery voltages that were like the given. And then mm -hmm. what else would we need? We would also need, say, the number of antennas that were deployed and stuff like that. So I think these I think like they say, the devil is, is in the details. I think all the details get really uh, clear to you uh, when you start the day in the life testing. Before that, it's usually revolving around uh, what my objectives are. And that starts at a very high level. But when you get down to testing, you discover that, okay, my objectives are these, but there are these tiny little things that I need to be able to get there. As well. Oh, yeah. I think the <laughs> thing that really gave us a good sense of that was when we did the overnight test. Yeah. So we did this really aws awesome, I don't know, this really this, insightful test. It was yes. it, it was pretty cool. And we, we learned a lot from it, um, where we stayed overnight in uh, ISTB4, the, the building that we were developing in. Yeah. And we camped out on the roof of this building. Um, so, and just stayed there all night and just tested doing typical operations with all of the hardware assembled, all of our flight interfaces plugged in. Um, now, the reason why we went to the roof was because we wanted to be able to get a GPS signal. 
Um, and we were developing in the basement of that building, so there was no GPS signal. We could just get telemetry from the GPS, but we had no way of, of really seeing it get the time from GPS satellites and then properly update the clock on the onboard computer. So we spent all night just testing all of this out, and that's where we, we really got to understand we understood more of the the features we needed, so like the the maintenance operations, and also even just like how to conduct uh, an a pass operationally. I think it's important to point out here that you know the way we structured the whole thing was uh, uh, literally day in the life, in the sense that we started off with okay, uh, we are going to have a pass every one hour, and the pass is going to be three minutes long. And uh, we had that entirely timed out that the first pass would just be get the heartbeat. Second pass would just be uh, upload a schedule file with third pass being take an image, fourth pass being download an image. So I think we put the structure into the whole day in the life test, which was what gave us the insight that we were looking for. I think it was frustrating about the roof test was because we, you know, we wanted like a very a methodical way of figuring out that process of, okay, what maintenance tasks are yeah. absolutely necessary to do before we actually uplink and execute a schedule. Um, so things like making sure we had the most recent heartbeat. Um, we right. also had a feature to request the last five minutes of data so we could you know see how things had been trending and if it was yeah. safe to, to actually upload that. Um, getting used to you know quickly looking through telemetry logs as well to to see if anything was going wrong doing doing tests like that it's really how we got like a feel for what the operations phase was actually going to be like and you know like what not just like in terms of what you do but even like what mental states you're in like when you only have a limited four minute window you're stressed and there's there's pressure to make sure that you are able to optimize that whole amount of time that you have access to the satellite. Um, and so, you know, part of it is like, you have to learn how to manage that. You have to recognize the, you have to recognize how you respond to being in these situations and get used to, get used to operating like that. So the more, the more you can do that before it's in orbit, the more prepared you're going to be and more relaxed you're going to be when it actually comes time um, to operate to operate your, your CubeSat. Um, the other thing that I think was, you know, it was important from more of these systems level tests was, um, you know, is, is kind of going back to the, the structure that we had on GitHub is saving, making sure that you're saving your output, like your command terminal output somewhere reliable, whether that be on GitHub or on like a Google Drive. Um, because when you're in the operations phase, you're not, no matter how many hours you've spent, like there's going to be things that like you're going to have to go back and recall. And so it's really important to make sure you have like that data saved somewhere. So if you encounter issues on orbit and you don't exactly remember, you know, what's going on, you have this command terminal output to refer to to say, oh, okay, yeah, these processes are, are being executed and like this is what we should expect to see. And so you know, it's it's probably fine. Um, like recording that, making sure you have knowledge of like what are your nominal values, um, how long should it take to perform certain operations. Um, all of that is really really important to track during your systems level test because once your satellite's gone, you're never and you don't have an an engineering unit, a full flight like engineering unit or flight equivalent engineering unit. Um, you are never going to get to try those things again. And that was the case for us because we ended, at the end, we only had one OBC. Um, and so once we delivered Phoenix, we, you know, we could never go back and, and test anything or debug anything. So, yeah. It's, a, it's expensive just to get the craft in space, but can you imagine how expensive it would be to convince ISS to rocket one of us up there with our laptops and go on an EVA and cache the satellite and reprogram it? Yeah. Honestly, I, I would of... love to personally volunteer to just be like the astronaut that goes and takes care of CubeSats. And it's like a little, like, <laughs> the tiny little CubeSat jet mom. Back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you just like go around to all of them and you can like plug in with a laptop and go, yeah, these are your diagnostics. 
<laughs> bring it back down to earth. That'll be like the dream job, though. <laughs> oh yeah. But yeah, for for sure, I think the importance of uh, you know getting uh, everything recorded, I think that's very very key. And I, I think that brings us back to the whole documentation part, because I mean, I'm sure like even even the things that I worked on, I don't remember the specific details of every single bit. And I had, I, there was like numerous times I had to go back and check what did I do five months back uh, and stuff like that. So I think that's, that's very, very important that you log everything in as much detail as possible. That just saves a lot of time and effort. If you really put time into documenting what you did in your GitHub issues and what you saw, what resulted from your changes, like, and you do that as you go, documentation really isn't that bad. And you are making sure that you have, you know, thorough traceability for everything that's in your CubeSat. Um, and so, yeah, you know, when it's five months long and you're like, what did, you know, why did I add that thing five months ago? Mm. Um, or, you know, what is this? You always have something to refer back to. And that's, that's so important. Uh, I think one final note on systems level testing is that you know just in addition to testing everything as a system the amount of time that you test for is also fairly important um so like we would test for full days as well to just see how that ate up system resources and to see if it you know anything eventually broke um and so really what that entailed was that we would just keep running different schedule files that did uh executed different things with you know, different time constraints in between them, but really keeping everything as flight-like as possible and um, just seeing seeing what that did and looking back at the telemetry and the event logs the next day and through downlinking them instead of just pulling them off of uh, the computer directly and, and seeing, you know, what had happened when we were away. Doing that really makes you feel comfortable knowing that your system is is really working just fine and it's going to work fine in orbit it's yeah. a lot for us it was a lot easier to do that with our flat sat as opposed to when it was fully assembled so making sure that you're getting all of that systems level testing in like as early as you possibly can and well before you're you're buttoning everything up um allowed allows you to just do a lot more with the system and in general um the the amount of time you spend testing really can't be understated or the amount of time that you should spend testing um i can say that in professional software development the the amount of time that you the ratio of testing to development is about three to one uh, yeah it's it's big yeah and it's it is, it's so hard to balance that uh, when you're a student too, and you know, you have all of these other things going on. Um, but, and, you know, I think that's where having, having a team becomes really handy because then you can kind of like split up the day to where maybe the beginning, like some, at some point during the day, someone's in the lab testing something. And so there's either constant development or constant testing kind of going on and, and, um, it makes it a lot easier to to kind of iterate and find those issues early but still make sure that you're kind of going about things as efficiently as possible and so right. yeah that's kind of that was more of the groove that we kind of got into towards the end was like you know we were just constantly on the obc and um you know someone would, would be testing their stuff and then they'd get to a stopping point it would switch to the next person and they would be testing and then uh testing there is fixing something running it again uh yeah yeah i think i think this reminds me of one thing so we already spoke about the importance of uh, having the central repository with issues and everything along with documentation uh but there's one more thing which i think towards the later part uh that we implemented that really helped us get back on schedule was the uh the excel sheet which was like the uh issue tracker of sorts uh, and that basically tracked all milestones because uh, what what we realized was that uh, if you have github issues that is really good when it comes to documenting all your issues but eventually like the branches you reach a point where all your issues you you have like 
a lot of issues. You have like 20, 30 issues, sometimes even more. And you don't know which one is important. So it, I mean, I remember at one point I had 10 issues uh, assigned to me or like directly indirectly assigned to me. Uh, now to be able to keep track of all 10 issues is rather tedious and you don't know at a glance which one is uh, more um, applicable uh, and which one is on a higher priority. So this is where what we did was we basically created like an Excel sheet where it tracks all the issues that are there in terms of what is the priority, what's the, uh, who is assigned to it and when we need to finish this by and if it's dependent on anything else. And this I think was helped in two ways. A, it helped uh, people know what uh, what are the things that is currently assigned to them? And second, uh, track, so pro, sorry, provide a, a sort of, uh, you know, visibility with uh, people like Danny and uh, Judd who wanted to know what's going on in the project to figure out where the team is and when they would finish what they are supposed to do. So I think, uh, you know, there are, you, you you could mix and match all of these different uh, uh, strategies in order to ensure that uh, A, the team is doing what they're supposed to do and B, they are doing it when they're supposed to do. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for mentioning that. that yeah, that is actually pretty huge. Um, and that definitely, you know, that was one of the tools that definitely and I took our requirements and, and objectives and really laid them out so things didn't seem so broad and everything. Once we had that, and like once we had the demos and we had like a direction, like development just got so much easier and um, a lot more straightforward, I think, for everybody. So yeah, that's that's a good thing to bring up. You know, um, that's so many issues and needed a therapist. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Yeah, I didn't didn't know whether to laugh or to tell you to keep your day job, so... <laughs> um, all right, so kind of, I guess, segueing off of, of that, uh, segueing off of that final thought, um, so we, we've talked a lot about development challenges and just development in general, but another, like, really big part of development, and I think one of the areas where, you know, we, we really probably learned the most, um, just in this project in general, is really just like working with people, especially in working with people uh, w while, you know, developing software and, you know, coordinating schedules and, and, and kind of getting everything to work. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> one, of, one of the biggest lessons learned was really just working with people, especially people who are interdisciplinary because, um, you know, anyone working on the software has to understand the context of what goes into develop of has to understand the context of what it of why that software is being has to be developed you know the certain way so like if you're working with the radio for example um, you you're dealing with these packets as they come in those packets have headers for community you know which are come from communications protocols like acts 25 um, and we don't want that in, you know, whatever message is going to the onboard computer. So you have to, you know, you have to work with um, the comms team in order to understand, okay, what does this packet look like? What's the actual data portion that I need? Uh, and how do I forward these on to, to our OBC such that, you know, it's, it's in the final file or configuration that we need. Um, and then, yeah, in general, you have to understand, you know, the hardware that you're working with and, and what's required to, to really make the system functional. Um, this this uh, reminds so me of one bit, which I'll just add here, uh, then you can continue. Uh, this reminds me of the time, you know, you're, you're talking about collaboration and it reminds me of the time when I had to, uh, you know, work, I was working on the downloading of uh, telemetry files and I needed to, Work, figure out uh, how the telemetry files are named. And I think Cody was working on that at that time. So the fact that we had this document, which helped us, helped me figure out, okay, who's working on it and try to work with him, what the uh, file naming convention was so that, so that I could, you know, put that into my, uh, 
code and that could uh, download the whole thing. So yeah, it definitely, definitely helped uh, that way. Yes. You know, something that I noticed throughout um, our project when it came to the team dynamics, right, was that uh, we had a lot of fluidity in our members, right? Or the word turnover seems really harsh, but, um, you know, the nature of it being a student project was that uh, it was not people's priorities, you know? I mean, it may have been the priority towards the end in the summer when you have no classes, you know, you just need to get the dang thing delivered, right? Um, or at the end of the semesters when your finals are over and you just need to crank out as much as possible. Like if you look at our commit history, it's really sporadic. And then there are these massive spikes um, corresponding to the ends of semesters or, or something like that when we have this time, right? But um, in, the, in the interim, school is priority, right? I mean, it's what, it's what you're there for, it's what you're paying for. So naturally, because of that, you're gonna get people who you're, you're going to have a lot of people who may not be there for very long, right? And may uh, may come in and then pop right out. We had a few semesters of that where our, our team just like exploded. And then, you know, by the end of the semester, it was the exact same size because the exchange people came in, realized like, holy crap, this is difficult and dropped off. Not because, you know, the thing's too hard or whatever, but it's just, it's just such a drain on time and resources and brain power that you need yeah. to be spending towards your classes, right? Um, and so something that I personally uh, feel that I didn't do very well as a lead, you know, I, I did it well-ish sometimes, but m could have done a lot better. Um, and what we could have done better as a team was valuing each other and, you know, more overtly, bit more team building. You know, I remember us using it. I remember... Um, I remember thinking that team building was nonsense, <laughs> um, right? You know, just like a stupid teenager me, you know, who thought that team building was just a complete waste of time, like all those exercises or whatever to get better, you know, teammates I thought it was just, just nonsense. Um, but it really, really matters, right? Um, uh, having those quality relationships with the people that you work with are incredibly important to keep uh, everybody working together, communicating really well, and keeping everyone happy. In uh, you know, companies know this, and and it's incredibly true in our case as well that human capital is very expensive, and we're not just talking about expensive as in terms of money, right? We're talking about expensive in time, in uh, effort, in quality of work product. Uh, it is very very expensive, and when you have those quality people, you want them to know that they are appreciated right and everybody here and everybody who's on the team uh was really really quality people um and there were a few times you know we were like uh you know let's go out and get a let's go out and get a drink after a day's work let's go out and have dinner like hey guys let me buy you some lunch you know that sort of stuff we did well um but i think we could have done more of that i think we could have had more more team building that wasn't just focused on the work I mean, like, it is fun to, to pull an all-nighter and work on the camera. It's fun to pull an all-nighter uh, on the roof. Um, but uh, all work, no play makes Jack a dull boy or something like that. Yeah. I think even though we didn't have that, I th we, all, had it we, all got along, we all got along really well. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, We're I think all workaholics. One thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, stuff like that is hard, too, when you've got stuff on your plate, you have your classes, you have anything else personal that's going on, and you know, in addition to this project. And so, but I think one thing that, that really helped is that when we were developing, we said, you know, you know every day from, like, 6 to 10 or, or, you know, whenever you can come in, these are our lab hours. And really, for the most part, like, a lot of people showed up during them and that's when we got a lot of really great work done because we were the the key thing with that was that you know we were all in the lab at the same time just trying to get things to work solving problems together having you know having discussions learning from one another on different programming methods and you know in that like we we joked around um we we had some great fun um and we all just bonded even even though you know it's you're sitting there and you're coding. Um, but we were all working on this project that we were really enthusiastic about and that we really loved. We really believed in and cared about. 
and um, we were doing it together. Uh, and and you know during that process we were still able to have like friendly conversations and, yeah. and laugh and uh, figure out how to get used to the the edges fan that was in there that was incredibly loud and just insanely annoying. So yeah, yeah I think I think that's one thing that helps with you know, situations like these when when you're or you're a student and yeah. every you know it feels like you're cramming all of the stuff into your schedule. So no, I think it was fun, you know, like we didn't have anything explicit like a team building per se outing, but uh, for sure, I mean, I remember the countless memes that we had floating around the uh, lab. Everything from uh, yeah, from dumpster fire and how you know, things are going wrong and yeah <laughs> we had we had those moments definitely and um, we didn't go out for team uh, outings but we stayed in our, in the lab late enough for all our cc parties to get over and the caterers coming to us and going like we have leftover food do you guys want it <laughs> oh yeah oh my god leftover <laughs> leftover event food was like God, just the best. It is the best. Yeah. <laughs> we even um, got a, yeah, I mean, this is fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like, like we, we found ways. When you're working on stuff like this, just having as many people in the same room as, as possible, it really doesn't only help with just team milling, but it really helps everyone just understand the system that they're working on. Um, because they're around people who are working on different things and you overhear things, you get into conversations you learn things that you didn't know before. Um, and so, you know, in terms of keeping people informed and um, having good camaraderie, yeah. having those like dedicated lab hours, I think really helped us a lot when it, when it came down to the grind, everything. Yeah. You know, it was a saving grace, I think. Hmm. Taco Bell was right across the street. <laughs> and it was open 24-7. Yeah. Yep. So at 4 a.m., Devin and Trevor and I, Go out and get Taco Bell, come back, do a little more work, and go to bed. Yeah, Taco Bell was like staple food at that time. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I tell you, I, I haven't eaten Taco first. Bell since. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Actually, you know what I think the saving grace was when Cody bought that small coffee machine and put it in the break room. And labeled and... it label maker? Yeah. And the was that yeah. why the label maker was labeled coffee machine? Exactly. No, it was it was already it was already labeled coffee machine. And I don't know who put that there, but then he bought a coffee machine and labeled it label maker. <laughs> but so Craig, you brought up something that I, I wanted to touch a little bit more on. Um, so student turnover in these projects is is high. And it, it's high for everybody. And it's it's high because of the reasons that you mentioned. You have school and it's not, you know, a project like this, you really like, you're, you can't require just 10 hours a week from it, uh, especially when you're working on software and you have to be there to test things out and sit there and debug your code because like your code's not going to work the first time. Yeah. And there's so many other features that have to be implemented along the way. It's it's a lot of, a lot of man hours. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And if you're signing up for a project like this, you have to understand that. And you have to be willing to commit to that. Um, because that's the only way that your CubeSat is going to get to space is if you have a team that's really dedicated to making it work. Those are the, the, those are the people who are going to get it to space. So working, working with people in that regard is, is hard. And it also makes recruitment very hard. So we, to, to continue with that thought, for a while we were doing interviews. Like, you know, Craig, you mentioned you came in through an interview process. And, and we did that thinking that that would, um, you know, kind of, that would allow us to keep people who are really interested and um, would be willing to stay and put in those hours because we knew that, you know, if they interviewed and they seemed like they were really enthusiastic and, you know, really interested in the project, then, um, then maybe we wouldn't have that problem. Hmm. And really the, but the issue, I mean, recruitment will, will allow you to find a lot of great people, um, but it's a lot of work. It's a uh. lot of time. It's <laughs> Oh, like, I know. Cause I mean, just the interviews themselves, like they take, they take days 
or well, depending on however many people you were interviewing. Um, like when we ah, did it, yes, it would no, take each individual. Sorry, just clarify. Each individual interview does not take days, but all of the yeah. interviews take a process of days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like inter interviews take a, a very long time, and um, the issue that we found is that you know we put all of our time in recruiting because we wanted to make sure that we hired we brought on good people and that we were we were training people who were going to be reliable and stay. Um, but even if, if people are very qualified, even if they're enthusiastic, like Craig, like you were saying, school always comes first mm -hmm. and people, even if you tell them that like, you're going to be putting in like 15 to 20 hours a week into this project, even if you tell them that they do not understand it oh, until yeah. they are actually doing it and they mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. Um, and that is what freaked uh, I don't know if it like freaked people out, but that's def that's the part when people really say, I do not have time for this and they leave. Mm -hmm. So now what you've done is you've spent all of your time interviewing people and onboarding them, bringing them into the project and they stay for only a couple of weeks. And when you're onboarding people, that's consuming resources from your team who is supposed to be developing and testing um, but has to, you know, now forego that because they have to make sure that they're getting the new people up to speed. So it really, we found, essentially, we found that interviewing had a negative impact on schedule and productivity. And it really didn't get us anywhere in the long run. We met some pretty cool people, um, but it, it so, really didn't get us so anywhere. I have a question here. So since I was part of this process at that time, what would you say would be a takeaway? Like, how do you avoid this situation? Oh, well, well so, I mean, like with interview, wait, what? What's the face? Uh, the, the face is, I don't agree at all. I had the exact opposite experience. The, the times I was there, the two times that we did recruitment when I was there, the first one we did very intentional, right? I mean, I constructed a pitch. I got people to come in for interviews. The interviews were long. <laughs> um, like each individual was pretty long. And, you know, I learned from that. I wouldn't do that again. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they were composed of quality questions, I think. And they got people's brains to engage and to really show what they knew. And it, it really clearly separated out the people who, you know, had very bright minds and, um you know, we're really enthusiastic in all the qualities that we wanted and those who, you know, may have had bright minds, but maybe just weren't a, a fit um, for the culture of the team, you know? And from those, the interviews that I did, th that that little section of interviews that I did, we got some really quality people that lasted base, almost the whole duration of the project. I mean, we got Trevor from those interviews. Um, we got, his name begins with C. I'm, I'm trying. Caesar. Caesar. We got Caesar oh, from those yeah. interviews. And Caesar was a huge asset to the team um the only reason that caesar had to drop off is because he had a i had like a full-time job or an internship or something like that but he contributed great amounts and then and then i um the next round we but those didn't people would have come on even if there weren't and if there wasn't an interview process true uh, yeah so That's you are what... correct um I just had a worse experience the second time around because we just let everybody come and then so many people dropped. So there's a little bias there then that I'm tripping mm -hmm. over. And I think I think you're right. Even though I had, I felt I had a good experience with interviews, you're right. And those people would have come on anyway. Um, and I believe, you know, their passions would have stuck it out and, uh, and they would have stayed around. So perhaps that devotion of time and effort into those interviews wasn't warranted. Yeah, that was... Um... That was, that was, I think, what, you know, what we found when we explored both options, both doing interviews and, you know, the second, the, in the later half, so this is like fall 2019 and onwards, um, we, no, I lied, that's, <laughs> that's after we delivered. So this is fall 2018 and onwards, um, we stopped doing interviews because we didn't, you know, we just had to focus all of our resources on development. We didn't have time to to do these anymore right, right. and we just said you know if you're interested in, in programming a satellite come on to the team and you know we'll we'll get you started on something um but when we did that we did rec we did onboarding differently than we did the first time around with interviews so with interviews once we onboarded people we were like okay these guys are going to stay 
And basically we spent a lot of time making sure people were brought up to speed. And that's where most of the effort went. The second time around, the the key change with onboarding was that people were responsible for engaging themselves and completing onboard tasks themselves uh-huh. uh, because it was so so the the point with that is that if people wanted to really stay and they really wanted to put effort in they needed they had to show it and you guys didn't necessarily have the bandwidth to give all of your resources to just to onboarding like you needed to keep working and so we would give them like a kind of a lower level task of they had to complete like a CFS app and once they got that working then we would give them you know the next task and usually there were a series of smaller ones we would you know see who stuck with it and like who who just kind of phased off uh who maybe needed pushing a little bit and the people who would complete like the lower level tasks were the people who we knew wanted to stay and who we knew would be reliable. And so once we saw that they completed these small things kind of on their own and they were really demonstrating that they were dedicated, then we would give them larger tasks like contributing to issues. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, the biggest like things, uh, uh, some people stick, some people don't. Because even when I think that's, you know, it's, it's just, people's preferences and their commitments and stuff. I just, this, this was like too cool for me, you know? So I came in and I was like, I have been interested, interested in uh, space ever since I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. It's, nothing was going to stop me. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I think the, I think it's very important uh, to gauge people's interest and their commitments. And that's something, uh, uh, I don't know how much you can do with interviews, but it's either people stick or don't stick. And that's a risk we have to uh, live with during the entire uh, phase. So, yeah. So final question, what is a favorite memory that you have from any point in the project can be related to development, can be unrelated to development? Um, but I have one. Tell me your story. But okay. I, think, I, th- I think, I think it's, go, and go, you, go. you guys will definitely agree on this the years months you spend on this project and then you ended off with the whole trip when we went to virginia and we saw the rocket take off that moment i think it's it just you know in that moment it sort of flashes back the amount of pain you've gone through the the fun times you've had the crazy things you've done in the past to get to this point and you just see this rocket in front of you take off and seconds later you can hear the rumble of the engines and it just leaves. I'm replaying it in my mind now. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm, like mm-hmm. I'm hearing the, the mm-hmm. engines. Um, it's pretty great. That was, I think that was, that was the most fulfilled one feels. I think it's worth all the hassle you go through the entire, entirety of the mm-hmm. project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like Vivek said, so, okay. So, uh, watch that thing like literally it's just it's like this just uh, okay so like sound travels travels slower than light right so like you see the plumes come out of that rocket before you hear anything and the rockets like um you know got this long beam of light underneath of it as it's like it's it's gone through like a hundred feet of climb before you even hear the engine start right and like then you hear that and it's like just fills your chest and like I, um, my sister had given me her iPhone to take a video of it for a class, but like, I was like, there's no way I'm getting a good video of this with the, this thing. So like it, it's going up and it's probably gone through like 500 feet at this point, you know, and it's just like all that stress and tears, and just a heartache and just pour into that rocket. And it's all just rocketing out of the atmosphere. And, so, <laughs> and I just, I just cried. <laughs> I freaking broke down weeping. It yeah. was, um. Yeah, that was great. That was really, really great. Yeah, I think that was probably one of like the happiest days of my life. Um, so I, I think really for me, what was my f- favorite? So I guess you know, on on the the topic of seeing the fruits of your work, like actually, you know, take off, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, my favorite memory from the project is I, I love the launch, but for me, it's deployment. Um, not only because like we got to watch Phoenix deploy from the ISS as a team in um, in the Marston Exploration Theater, that was incredible in itself. Because like you're like you're watching your CubeSat and you can see it like falling back towards the Earth, and it's you know just this eventually it just becomes like this little speck. But the best part of deployment was seeing the beacon. Yeah. So. <laughs> CubeSats have this 30-minute silent period between when you deploy and when you're allowed to actually turn on your transmitter or deploy any of your appendages, uh, antennas, solar panels. And so after that, that 30 minutes, that's when your transmitter is officially allowed to start sending out health beacons. And so like that 30 minutes, you know, it's really worrying because you're just wondering, oh, you know, like, is it is it going to be working or are we going to hear anything? Um, and... 30 minutes later, I got this notification on my phone. It was an email from uh, someone in the amateur radio community who had heard Phoenix's health beacon. And I remember on your wall. opening up that email and, and looking, at, um, looking at the data. And you can see the call signs in, in the header. And it, it, you know, that's indicating that it's coming from Phoenix. And just the most incredible moment was just seeing that and yeah. you know wrapping your head around the fact that like this is in space yeah. and it worked like we actually got something from it and i remember like i i just like i looked at that and i just like cried i cried for like mm -hmm. 10 minutes straight or something like that because i just like could not believe that after all of that work you know this is this is where we were um and then eventually I, I was like, okay, I should actually analyze this data and make sure that <laughs> no, it's telling me that the CubeSat's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I need, need to like get over, yeah. get over this now. And, you know, I remember like Vivek, you and I were, were uh, communicating uh, and uh, I think we had a pass at like, uh, was it yeah. five in the morning or seven in the morning? And so we're we like, yeah, I'll meet you in the control there. room and let's. <laughs> yeah. I, I specifically remember this part. So we had a, we had a, a, good pass at seven and we had a mayor pass at like five something right yeah. and we got these messages and we were like you know sarah was like should we go there and i was like i'm on my way <laughs> <laughs> i was I'm like okay going i'm gonna there. drive I'll, I'll drive there and i'll try to see through my tears <laughs> like, i'll see you in five <laughs> and we reached we reached we were like we going to be there you know we didn't of course we didn't receive any packet during a five o'clock pass but uh the seven o'clock pass we did yeah, and I think that like the elevation was like 19 degrees or something. Yeah. It was really small. So like we knew we weren't going to see anything, but we were like, yeah, we're going to go. We anyway. just wanted to be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but yeah, and then and then throughout the day, more trickled in and, you know, it was like, ah, oh, you know, it's not a one-off thing. Like it still works. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then throughout the day, we were able to like uplink schedules and, and try out those actual, uh, those maintenance commands that we had developed on the ground and you know now actually when the CubeSat was in orbit so um yeah deployment deployment was definitely definitely that like the happiest day i think i've ever had in my life no i i mean i i would say this that you know see just the fact that you work on something and that uh goes into space so everything from the launch to deployment is just they, these these steps which tell you that you know it's 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 out there and you've created something it was it was lying on a table uh, a few months back and we were like fiddling with it and we were like playing around and blew up some components maybe and fixed some you know but at the end of all of that stuff we have this piece of hardware that that we literally built ourselves and is out there in space i think that's something that's just crazy uh, motivating for me and I think everybody on the team that you know you get to work on something that's literally out of this world <laughs> yeah what a gift yeah thanks for accepting me Sarah thank you for listening to that man in the trench coat <laughs> coming for an interview <laughs> but yeah. yeah I think the big thanks to even all those people who helped like include 
definitely the entire team sir you uh, i think uh, even jod danny the way they they showed the support i think that's that's that was also very important and also all the, all our vendors right even from uh, people who helped us out debugging all our uh, uh, specific hardware issues uh, you know replacing things if it broke down i think it, it all builds up to this experience people from the amateur community the radio community they all helped us a lot when it came to uh, the whole journey from start to finish so big thanks yeah. to everyone yeah you know i don't i don't know who's listening right now but um if uh, anybody from the the team is listening um and anybody who was ever on the team in any capacity thank you so so much for contributing what you did I I mean honestly like I don't know how many people I've told this to but like I've just I got I don't know how the heck I got so lucky with all of you guys I like I'm just really I think we just we had like the greatest team that I think anyone could have had on this project and yeah Go oh, Phoenix <laughs> Yeah And thus, the tales of our flight software development are complete. Thank you all so much for listening in on this episode. And now you know that Phoenix is powered by lithium-ion batteries and operated based on the fruit of several cups of coffee and undergraduate student tears. If you want to learn more about Phoenix, you can visit our website, and I'll put a link to that in the description. In addition to describing the spacecraft and the science objective, the website also includes various resources that we use to develop Phoenix, along with documents that we wrote along the way, such as our proposal to NASA, licensing applications, and design reviews. If you have any questions on what we've discussed in this episode, or if you're developing a CubeSat yourself and you just want to talk about our experiences, please feel free to reach out to us. We are more than willing to help anyone who's looking for it. Why can't I read this? And hopefully sharing our lessons learned and experiences allows others to make faster and more efficient progress and explore or test things in even more depth than we were really able to. So huge thanks again to Vivek and Craig for sitting down with me today to recount what it really took to make Phoenix work. If you've been enjoying this podcast and you want to support it, please share these episodes with your friends who may be interested in them. And don't forget to follow this on your favorite podcast source and on Facebook to get notifications on upcoming episodes. Finally, as always, your feedback is greatly appreciated so that way I can make this podcast as useful to you as I possibly can. For more content on the art of space engineering, tune in every three weeks when I'll post a new episode. With that, here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers. Sarah.